You know, when we started interviewing all the amazing talent at WATG for the drawing board in Series 1, an interesting fact would surface. Nearly every one of them played Lego when they were kids. It was there that we realized what an incredible opportunity it would be to find out more about the creative minds that create simply stunning hospitality spaces around the world. Not just about their process, but about them, their story, their path, their unique lives. Hello and welcome to The Drawing Board. I'm Monita Rajpal. In this series, we are getting up close and personal with our guests. Who are they? What brought them to their profession? What were they like as kids? And what do they bring to their work that is just uniquely them? My guest today is Raghavendra Shanbhag. Shan, as he is known, is an associate principal in the architecture arm of WATG. As a senior member of WATG's leadership team, Shan's passion for concepts, branding, and storytelling has seen him lead several projects spanning four continents with master planning, architecture, and interior design, all part of his ever-growing portfolio. His imagination and creating are amongst his greatest assets, attributes he started to nurture as a young boy growing up in Bangalore, India. An avid Lego builder, as most of his colleagues were, Sean knew that exploring the world through design would be a major driving force in his professional choices. And having seen his own father come back with stories from beyond the shores that surrounded him, he was determined to travel further and to see more. Yet. There is more that meets the eye with Sean, with some surprising and fun facts that come to the surface in our engaging conversation. Sean joins me from WATG Studio in Singapore. Sean, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Tell me a little bit about yourself. I'm originally from India. I grew up in Bangalore. I did my bachelor's in India in architecture, but I moved to US, to Florida, to do my master's in architecture. And since then I joined WATG and I have worked in multiple offices in the United States before calling Singapore as my home. And I have moved to Singapore since what, 2012 now, about 10 years. Mm. And I've been working across Southeast Asia, Middle East and other areas in hospitality design mainly. What was that move like for you from uh, India to Florida? Yeah, it is fascinating, right? <laughs> when when I did my bachelor's, it was still the pre-internet era. So I wanted to go somewhere in United States uh, where the climate is similar to India and I don't get frozen. <laughs> that, that was one of my uh, issues. So Florida was the best place I could re imagine. And uh, yeah, that's the main reason, the climate. What was the experience like for you? Very interesting. It's a cultural change when I moved, but I anticipated, anticipated it because I was reading a lot of books. I knew what, what was what and other things. So it was a welcome move for me to yes. kind of uh, move to a different culture, understand more better. I was more fascinated in travel and understanding different cultures. So that was my fascination when I, I was growing up. So it was a natural welcome move. What brought you to architecture? as a profession? Interesting. Good question. <laughs> While I was growing up, there were three or four different things I was interested in. First thing is about stories. I grew up as a child hearing stories and I used to be a little bit in acting and uh, stand-up comedy as well. So expressing something came natural to me. So I took part in dramas, whatnot. And I wanted to select a course which had an emotional side and practical side where I can solve problems using my one of my brains, but still show my emotional talent of expressing something mm. through an object or through an experience. So that uh, sounds quite right as an answer for this. No, I think it sounds amazing because I think, well, there's so many things I want to uh, pick up on from there. First of all, stand up comedy. Yes, I did a little bit of Hindi stand-up comedy and uh, yeah. a bit of theater when I was uh, in my school and college. Mm. So You know what, the reason why I ask, because stand-up comedy is something that you, requires a lot of courage, right? Because <laughs> you're really putting yourself out there. Yes, 
exactly and i have missed many times up so <laughs> <laughs> in front of audience embarrassed but yeah you you stumble and keep going right yeah yeah that's 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 fascinating you know one of the things you talked about there also was the emotional side architecture is there to elicit emotions right whenever we go into any city or we see any building any structure Obviously, what we're looking, we, we, we look at it from a visual perspective, but we feel it. Talk to me about how you become emotionally intelligent as an architect. Every space, if you see an empty space, it usually has a past, it has a present, and it has a future. Mm -hmm. So there is a space-time continuum happening on every individual space, right? Certain spaces have a very recognizable past. Certain place, spaces don't have. As an architect, when I enter to design a building, I try to connect all these three together mm. so that when you are there, you know where you are, you know what the life patterns are around you, you know what the culture is, you're kind of introducing yourself along with in form of a building and the building talks all mm. three realms and it gives you an, uh, an open-ended space where you can Re, uh, reinforce yourself as a future also. Mm. So it's it's kind of connecting the three realms. I find yes. that fascinating because it's also yes. very much a sustainable practice too, isn't it? Is the sense that this something that you create should be able to stand for a long time, should be able to be relevant, I should say, I guess, is the better word for a long time. Definitely, yes. Definitely, yes. And uh, I think Leon Cryer, the famous urban planner, has a term called sense of place. Mm. And it's extremely a strong word because every project, especially in hospitality design, when you come, people are coming there to take some memories back. Mm. You're coming there to enjoy. You're going to go around, enjoy the culture, enjoy the food. But before going, you take a selfie. Means you're going to share it with people. So it's a memory. And it's a very big responsibility for architects, especially hospitality designers, because mm. we are not creating buildings. We are actually creating experiences which people take away with them. So it's, it's actually it's, quite a responsible job. It's so true. You, you talked about the space-time continuum. I read your, your master's thesis, which was called Space-Time Continuum, a design approach for the built environment. In it, you said, where you described design as frozen music, where you also say as designers, we act as orchestrators weaving together the unique experience of a place with the engineered environment. Talk to me about that idea of design being frozen music. I love that. It's interesting. This thesis was written in about in the year 2006. So at that time, I gave this term called frozen music. But now times have changed. Times have actually become more dynamic. Mm -hmm. So it's not frozen anymore. It's more interacting now. So architecture is almost like these spaces which we are creating, which tell you about a particular time, but yet give a space to continue the time also. Yeah. So it's more yeah. of a symphony now, isn't it? It's more like a symphony. It's like opening up for the next generation, bringing in future, but yet standing itself as timeless space. That's beautiful. You know, when you were starting out in your profession, mm -hmm. did you have a specific goal in mind? Well, definitely, yes. I, I wanted to travel as much as possible, see the world. Because when, when I was growing up, there was no internet, right? So yeah. US seemed very far to me. <laughs> now everything is closed. So I wanted to go as many places, travel as many places, be able to create projects, create experiences in different parts of the world. So that actually brings in or kind of gives into my hunger, right, of uh, an actor being filling in different shoots and be able to create projects and destinations for future. What was it like growing up in Bangalore? What were you like as a kid? As a kid, I was, I would say, a normal kid growing up. I had a lot of curiosity. Uh, I would go to libraries every week, read about different places, cultures, and try to find every opportunity to get into acting, theater, and all those things. But, you know, cricket is extremely 
famous in India. I'm, I'm sure you know that. So I used to play club level cricket also. When I was growing up, I was sporty. And the good sweet spot was to do something which is practical as well as artistic. What kind of toys did you play with when you were a kid? Oh, yeah, I did have a Lego set, by the way. When I was growing up, my dad bought me a Lego set, which I used to use to create forms. Mm -hmm. And uh, fascinatingly, I used to use rubber bands to make arrows. And uh, I was extremely mischievous, trying to find every bit of way to create problems in the class. I used to be a <laughs> backbencher. And usually backbenchers are very good because they can multitask. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way of putting it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you can still listen, but you can do multitask and still be creative doing some other things. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's very true. Um, who would you say was or were or still are the biggest influences in your life? When I was growing, you know, right? 1983, Kapil Dev won the World Cup. I wanted to be a cricket player in the beginning. So Kapil Dev was actually my role model when I started growing. But when I went into architecture, it was actually Frank Lloyd Wright and I read Fountainhead. Mm. And the Howard Rooks character kind of stuck in me. <laughs> and that's something I was quite fascinated with. So I, I would say these are the two people, one from India and one from more like a fiction <laughs> kind yeah. of stuck with me. For, for coming days, yeah. What were your folks like? My parents came from a very humble background. I actually came from a very humble background in India. I'm probably the first professional from my family of uh, 50, 60 people. <laughs> but my dad had traveled a little bit of world and he would tell me a lot of stories of his growth and how he went through the forest, how he went mm. through. So all those kind of is imbibed in me in terms of listening to the stories and going for evening walks. I still go for long walks in the evening yeah. uh, to keep my calories also, but it became a habit. When you're growing up, you know, we are often shaped by what we see, by what mm -hmm. we feel and what is around us and how our parents interact with us as well. And I'm curious how that impacted your view of the world, your mm. world. Interesting. You know, the Columbus, every, every family has a Columbus, right? Mm -hmm. Who you usually start and you are the first person to get out and do break the rule and do something. My dad was the Columbus of his family. When he was growing up, he, he grew up in a small town and he was the first person to go to Mumbai from his family. And that was a big thing at that time. And in my times, I learned saying, okay, you were the Columbus of your family. I have to do something bigger than that so i have to travel even beyond mumbai i guess so yeah. my aim was to travel around the world so i picked on him basically beautiful what do you think are the conversations mm -hmm. that or the questions that need to be asked in architecture today the questions definitely in terms of hospitality design if you put together put it uh, definitely you have to ask about the intent and extent about what you're doing what is your intent, basically? Why is this product there in the first place? And what is the extent? When you say extent, it's the price factor. It's how much, if you put a pie, how, in which direction, how much direction can I break the rules? So it's very important to understand the both ends of the spectrum before we put the pen on the paper. Yeah. And uh, in terms of having casual conversations, when you go through the site, when you meet the client a couple of times, you get kind of a understanding that, oh, yeah, this is what we can do. And a few of the projects are legacy projects for a few developers. Yeah. Uh, that means they can break rules quite a bit. But a few of them are more like a business models. So it still has to give them rate of return and average daily rate. So there are a lot of aspects. So we have to take from financial aspect and creativity aspect as well. There are moments, right, in our the work that we do that are real reminders of why we do or why we've chosen to do what we do. What are some of the projects mm -hmm. that you've worked on that have given you that, that sense or that feeling? Yeah, the couple of projects I can think about is one is the Crown Plaza in Highton Bay. This was a hotel, which is almost like a sausage sitting on a chopsticks. 
Um, it's on Haitang Bay where there are many hotels. The competition is very high over there. Mm -hmm. So we had to create a product which was unique, which was all slightly different from the existing competition. We even put a pool on the rooftop in those times and it's like a herringbone pattern. But we broke a lot of rules in terms of hospitality design. The public spaces were non-air conditioned, guest rooms on the tops were air conditioned. So we broke the traditional hospitality rules. The second one, which is ongoing, uh, I'm not supposed to tell the names, but... <laughs> Uh, because of NDA, but there is a, a very high-end destination resort in Philippines, which, were, which we are working on in uh, New Clark City. And uh, that one is in mountains. So mm -hmm. it's about creating a story which the natives, it's related to the native tribes. It's also about bringing their artistry into the hotel, mm -hmm. as well as because in, in, in that location, there was a volcano which happened in 1990 and wiped off a village and wiped off flora and fauna. So creating something where the flora and fauna comes back, the birds come back, it's much more satisfying. And giving even the artist some amount of work and celebrating that in your product is highly fulfilling. It goes beyond giving an experience. It goes into the realm of giving back to society. So yeah. I think that project is something I like. You talk about stories and how mm. architecture and design is a, is a form of storytelling. And I do hear that quite a lot. What kind of stories do you want to tell through your work? It's about uh, doing a work where it kind of stitches the urban fabric. It stitches the neighborhood. You want to be a part of a neighborhood where the project is located. You want to seamlessly blend. And you want to celebrate the people around. You want to celebrate the culture around. Even like restaurants, the food, like if you're in Hanoi, you're pho. If you are in Philippines, you're that hanging rice. It's, it's all about touch and feel as well as being in the space. So it's multiple levels of food, culture, fabrics, pattern, space, and the lifestyle as well, which we want to emulate in our design, right? Yeah. All that creates memory as a whole. So story is uh, a way of weaving all these experiences together as a cohesive whole. What do you believe are your strengths? My strength is definitely storytelling and conceptualization and ideation. It's all about absorbing what's around me mm. and finding the right uh, thing that can be celebrated, right aspect that can be celebrated in a hotel. And that itself becomes a branding aspect or a USP, a unique selling proposition for the hotel itself or the destination, whichever we are doing. It requires quite an active and extensive and an intelligent as well as a free sense of imagination that you can go anywhere and figure out ways to construct and build, right? Definitely, yes. It requires a lot of study. It requires a lot of multiple layers of uh, an analyzing the site and analyzing the surrounding so that you can take what is the best and that becomes your elixir of design. Yeah. What do you want people to know about you that they perhaps don't already know? Hmm. Interesting question. <laughs> I'm a humorous person. <laughs> I actually crack a lot of jokes and I'm very calm and relaxed. And definitely I like telling stories and I'm very long-winded. So usually <laughs> if you talk to me in about 15 minutes, you will know most, most of the things about me because I'm extremely transparent. <laughs> so That's great. Yeah. No. <laughs> so what yes. I want to do now, I want to go through some quick fire questions. Okay. Sure. So let's start. Tell me about some jobs that you've had in the past. Some jobs. In US, I worked for a realtor and I used to go and stand with boards in front of houses saying that, okay, this one is on sale. Please come inside. I will show you around as a secondary thing. And I also was a teaching assistant in school. I used to teach 3D Max and show how to do walkthroughs and presentation. Yeah. And... Yeah, otherwise, most of my life is 
<laughs> in architecture itself. Yeah. What did you grow up believing? I always, I'm a very, very optimistic person. So I always see light at the end of the tunnel. So whichever situation you put in, it's only a matter of time you see the light. That's what I believe. That's really nice. What were you taught was fundamental to a fulfilling life? Huh. Interesting. Definitely being very humble. At whatever level you are, you have to have that level of humbleness in you. That keeps you grounded and that keeps you attracting other people so that they can open up to you. So that's, that's, that's my way. Is that what and you were taught? Or is it... Yes, okay. that's what something I was taught by my, by my parents. Beverage of choice? Beer. Favorite meal? Tandoori chicken. Ah, oh, now we're talking. <laughs> yeah. Where would you most like to travel to that you haven't already been? I would like to go to Egypt and I want to go into a pyramid, go deep inside the king's chamber. Hmm. Why? It's very mystical. I always grew up reading about mummies and pyramids. So I know how spectacular it looks from outside, but I want to see how scary it looks from inside. It's the opposite. If you could ask God, the universe, whatever it is that you believe in, one question, what would it be? Can someone pay architects better? <laughs> <laughs> you did say you were a stand-up comic, so, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, what was the dumbest dare you ever agreed to? Dumbest dare that I ever agreed to. Okay. Somebody gave me a spoonful of wasabi and asked me to put it in my mouth. And I did it to regret eventually. <laughs> yeah, I bet. A spoonful. <laughs> a spoonful. Wow. wow. <laughs> Are you still friends with this person? <laughs> <laughs> um, what feeling are you searching for most when you're working? Definitely something that surprises that is out of norm and that breaks the rhythm. I think that it might be good or bad, it doesn't matter, but something with that breaks the rhythm. Sean, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Hope I was not long-winded. Not <laughs> at all. Thank you so much. I had a wonderful time. Pleasure meeting you. That was Raghavendra Shanbagh, WATG's architect and associate principal, joining me from Singapore. You've been listening to The Drawing Board, a WATG podcast. I'm Monita Rajpal. Thank you for joining us.